Okay, how do we get these off? Get them on, can't get them off, right? <laughs> Just a minute. There we go. Happy Father's Day. It kind of seems weird to have a Father's Day without the smell of bacon out on the patio. Um, but we have on your way out bacon cookies, dads. Okay, so be sure and, and pick up your bag of bacon cookies. Thank you, Barbara Ellis and her team. And for those of you who are worshiping at home, um, if you've been on our cookie delivery list, we're making arrangements for you to get your cookies delivered to you. I lost my dad about four years ago. Um, seemed like yesterday. I was lucky. Um, I had a great dad, but not everybody does. Um, his parents, for example, were divorced while he was in middle school. During that time before the divorce, when things were really bad at home, one of his neighbors started taking him to the Presbyterian Church in Dodge City, Kansas. And then after the divorce, when my grandmother moved my dad and uncle out here to Hollywood, my dad started to attend the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. One time when I was um, in seminary, and I was really struggling with the verse in 1 Timothy about women teaching men and the whole idea of becoming a pastor. I told my dad about my struggle. And he simply asked, do you know who my Sunday school teacher was? Well, that ended the discussion. His high school Sunday school teacher was Henrietta Mears. She was credited with founding Forest Home, Gospel Life, publishing company, and she had great influence on people like Louis Evans Jr. and Bill Bright and Dale Bruner and some lesser known guy by the name of Billy Graham. I can still remember my, my dad saying at one point, I didn't know how to be a man, a husband, a father, but I learned by reading this book, by trying to do what Jesus did, by being obedient to Jesus. My dad taught me all about the love of Jesus, about seeking to live a life that bore fruit that would last. And that's what our passage today is all about. We are called to bear lasting fruit by doing what Jesus did. Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of John, verses 9 through 17. I have asked Elder Kylie Dunn to read that passage. So would you please stand as she reads our scripture this morning. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Thanks, Kylie. Go ahead and be seated. So first, Jesus teaches us that the only way we can bear lasting fruit is by living into the love of the Father. A few weeks ago, Andrea, our parish associate, talked about the word love that's found in this passage. It's the word agape. One person I, I read said it, this way, agape love is a decision to give oneself utterly for the other. In fact, one could read verse nine this way, as the Father has given himself utterly to me, so I have given myself utterly to you. Now remain in my self-givingness. Or you might read verse 12, my command is this, give yourself utterly to each other, as I have given myself utterly to you. Greater self-givingness has no one than this, that he lay down his life, his all, his everything for his friends. This type of self-givingness 
is not so much an emotion as, as a choice. It doesn't come out of pity, it comes out of respect, out of valuing the other person. And in fact, it actually raises the value of the one given to. And so Jesus says, I don't call you slave anymore, I call you friends. You see, a master doesn't give his life for his slaves. By giving his life for us, Jesus changes our status. He gives us worth. We're now his friends. You see, Jesus is not asking that we obey him out of blind submission or out of a position of subordination, but out of friendship. Our obedience to him is in response to his giving, his continuing to give, his all for us. Let me ask you, do you see Jesus as your friend? Do you really trust that he will give you everything you need? I would challenge you, cultivate that friendship with Jesus. You know, take time at least 15 minutes every day, maybe in the morning and maybe at night, and just sit with Jesus. Tell him what's on your heart and then just sit with him and let him love on you. You see, Jesus' life was lived in response to entrusting the utter self-givingness of the Father. Uh, around Easter, I was listening to a podcast. I can't remember. It was either by N.T. Wright or, or by Tim Keller. But they asked this question. They said, how could the human Jesus, the man Jesus, go to the cross? Why didn't he run? And the answer was that he utterly trusted in God's love in God giving him all things. He trusted that God would only do what was absolutely best. And here Jesus says that if we would follow his example, if we too would trust in his utter self-givingness, then we too would bear fruit that would last. Back in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, where this whole upper room discourse begins, we're told that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to return to the Father. And so he loved his disciples to the end. He gets up from the table, he takes off the outer robe of status, of a privilege, of being a teacher. And he takes up the towel of a servant and he wraps it around his waist. And he got down and he washed the disciples' feet giving them an example that they should do the same, that they should take off their robes of privilege and pick up a servant's towel. Dale Bruner says it this way. He says, our call is to relax in God's love. I love that word, relax. For us overachievers, that's not always easy to do. Relax in his love and then give that love to others, to trust Jesus, to let him wash our feet to be cleansed by his work on the cross, and then go to people who need cleansing, giving our lives for them, doing what they need done. To bear fruit that will last, we're called to follow the example of Jesus, relying completely on the utter self-givingness of the Father. But then we're to follow Jesus' example in being obedient, in discovering joy, in glorifying the Father. In a sense, we're, we're to kick back and then kick in. We're, we're to inhale Jesus, the love of Jesus, and then exhale his love for others. I mean, through our masks, of course. Now, I, I struggle with that word obedient. Um, I, I'm rather strong-willed. Some of you have noticed that about me. I'm trying to work on it, I'm, I'm sorry. but. Something that does help me is the way John in his gospel talks about Jesus' way of life. You see, John tells us that everything Jesus does is in response to his desire to give glory to the Father. Yes, obedience, but not a legalistic obedience, but obedience with a purpose, with a direction to glorify Father, to love the Father back. You see, Jesus finds meaning and purpose in life, not in trying to hold on to this life, but in laying it aside in order that the Father may be glorified. 
see, Jesus didn't have a program of his own. He didn't have a career for himself. He didn't have an identity or an agenda or a to-do list. He simply evaluated everything, every action, based on what would bring glory to God. A, a few weeks ago at the end of the Sunday morning adult class, John Riddles gave us a challenge to go into each day seeking to just glorify God. To not get caught up in the events of the day, to, to not even get caught up in ourselves and what we're feeling or struggling with, but to channel our emotions, to channel our energies into asking every moment of the day, how can I in this situation glorify Jesus? Trusting that Jesus will give me everything that I need. I mean, this means asking questions like, how can I raise my children in a way that glorifies the Father? How can I do my job in a way that glorifies the Father? How can I use this time of self-quarantine in a way that glorifies Jesus? How in this conversation, this situation, can I not so much express my personal views, but glorify the Father? Nicky Gumbel says it this way, life is not a competition that you have to win. It's not supposed to be a rat race. Life is a huge privilege. It's an opportunity. God has trusted us with gifts and abilities, and he wants us to use them. He is faithful to us, and he calls us to be faithful to him. Our calling is to use each gift, to use this life, not as something we grasp onto and hold onto, but as a means of glorifying the Father. I mean, there is so much around us that wants to take the joy out of us. But somehow, Jesus, in the midst of going to the cross, had joy. Oh, he wept over Jerusalem. I'm not saying we don't cry over what's going on around us. Jesus did, and Jesus does. And yes, Jesus cried out in pain on the cross, asking, God, where are you? But even in the midst of the cross, even in the midst of all that we face, of the injustice and the pandemic and the unrest, it's possible to have joy. How? By following the example of Jesus, by going into each day with one purpose, come what may, to give glory to God. Hebrews says it this way, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy of glorifying the Father, Jesus could even withstand the cross. And so in order to bear fruit that lasts, we're called to trust the utter self-givingness of the Father. And then we're called to find joy in glorifying the Father and glorifying Jesus. And then finally, to bear fruit that lasts, we're to follow Jesus' example into self-sacrificing mission. You see, our lives have a purpose. We're to live out that purpose by doing what Jesus did, giving our lives to others, and thus bearing fruit that lasts. Paul, in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, says it this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's utter self-givingness, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, to not conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by, by thinking as Jesus thought. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. You'll be able to live as Jesus lived and bear fruit that lasts. You see, when we give ourselves in love to others, change happens. There's this really old movie called The Bride of Frankenstein. There's this great scene where, where the monster Frankenstein stumbles into a blind man's cottage in the forest. Now the blind man, of course, can't see the hideousness of the monster, but he perceives that the monster can't speak. And he says, are you afflicted? as I am. I can't see, you can't speak. Maybe we can help each other. Maybe we can be friends. And for a very brief time, Frankenstein lives in the blind man's cottage and he listens to music that the blind man plays on his violin. 
And the blind man teaches him to speak, learning words like good and food and friend. This episode ends when a group of hunters come to the cottage and they see the monster and they try to attack it. And in the process, they burn down the cottage. And the last scene is of Frankenstein groping out into the cold wilderness, just saying, friend, friend. The monster had been changed by the utter self-givingness of the man. In many ways, these last weeks, we've seen how the giving of a life can change the world. George Floyd's death has changed our world, but so also Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and the teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary. And I don't know if you remember the movie, Saving Private Ryan. N.T. Wright says this, he makes the comment that Rome ruled its empire through the power of the cross. People lived in fear of the cross. But Wright says that at the cross, God replaced the love of power with the power of God's love. He replaced the love of power with the power of God's love. And in doing so, he changed the world. Remember the parable that Jesus told, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can't bear fruit? Our calling is to die, to die to the ways of this world, to die to our agendas, and instead follow Jesus' example in dying for others, that, that fruit that lasts will be produced. I have a, a book titled, the, the Hundred Names of God. One of those names is Gardener. The author notes that this book be, begins in a garden. And when that garden is ruined, God institutes a plan to restore his garden. He grew up a nation. He sent a son to defeat Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus rose victorious from a garden tomb. And the final chapters of this book, we read about a new creation, a new garden, a new heaven, and a new earth. In the meantime, we have a calling not to work for the kingdom of this world, but to partner with God in restoring his garden, to partner with God in bearing fruit. And God uses our day-to-day -day situations, our jobs, our homes, as the field where we're to cultivate that fruit. Last week, Pastor Tim told the parable about the landowner who left his vineyard in the hands of the servants and, and went away. But the servants began to act as if the vineyard belonged to them. The vineyards are lives. The vineyards this world. And last week I found myself asking, am I acting as if my life, this life belongs to me? Because it doesn't. My life belongs to God. When Jesus talks about bearing fruit that lasts, he's asking us to be image bearers that reflect the God's glory into the world, that others would see God. He's asking us to show others how to live life as life was meant to be lived. Not through the attainment and exercise of wealth and power, but through utter self-giving love. He's asking that we partner with him in restoring the world to its intended creation. You know, when the nation of Israel forgot its purpose to bear fruit, he sent prophets out to remind them. In Isaiah 5, 7, for example, we find these words, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delights in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, and righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You see, dying for others is not so much about our giving our physical lives over to death as it is about working for justice, as it is about relating to people as Jesus did and taught. You know, back in Jesus' day, everybody tried to get Jesus to make life better according to their agenda. But Jesus was less about an agenda. 
He was more about giving himself to one person at a time in self-giving love. And he taught us to do the same, to relate to others day in and day out with humility, being poor in spirit rather than proud, being meek and gentle, being merciful and forgiving, being willing to turn the other cheek when people speak ill of, of us, being willing to die to my need to be right, letting God be my defender and justifier. How did God fulfill his mission? By calling people to blind obedience, by telling them they were wrong? No. He became one of them and died to himself in order to love them, elevating them to the status of friend. And our mission is to do the same. Jesus chose us. He appointed us to be fruit bearers. We have a mission to live as Jesus lived, abiding in the love of the Father, seeking to glorify the Father, giving our lives sacrificially, loving others, replacing the love of power and wealth and comfort with the power of God's sacrificial, self-giving love. The last words I remember my dad speaking were in the ICU room. His pastor, came in to visit him and he turned to Doug with this big smile on his face and he said, Doug, I gotta go home and be with Jesus. It was weird. I sensed at the time that my father had lived his life on mission and that the mission had been accomplished. Job well done. You see, my dad learned to live life by following Jesus' example. He kept himself in the love of the Father. He sought to give, to live life glorifying God. And he sought in whatever circumstance he's, he found himself in to love others, to extend himself to others. How are we doing? Would you join me in prayer? Father, forgive us. It is so easy to get entangled in the things of this world. Send your spirit, empower us that we might be so assured and filled with your love that we can love others. And if you've never known the power of being a friend with Jesus, just say, Jesus, I want you to be my friend. Come into my life, make yourself known to me. And Lord, thanks for dads. Bless them. Strengthen them. May we all live to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.